Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second part of the fearless data sharing across Europe, uh, across borders, sorry, uh, session. Uh, my name is Ron Trompert. I am the group leader of the online data, uh, online data services service at uh, team at SURF, uh, and I'll be your host for this afternoon. Uh, the topic of this uh, session will be data backpacking through Europe, in which we're going to address uh, the, the number of uh, European projects that uh, SURF is involved in, and we're also going to discuss uh, well, what the benefits will be for, uh, for our users. The first speaker uh, in our session will be uh, Dr. Bob Jones. Uh, Bob, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon, Bob. Uh, thank uh, for being us. Uh, being with us this afternoon and uh, that you could spare the time to, to join us. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Bob Jones uh, joined CERN at, uh, in 1986. Uh, the first time I came across the name Bob Jones was during the uh, European Data Grid project uh, where also I was involved in and Bob was the deputy director. So he has uh, two decades of European projects under his belt. Uh, also, he's been director of the EGE projects, the Helix Nebula project, and now uh, recently he has been appointed to, the, uh, to be the director of the EOSC Association. Uh, he is going to discuss uh, the, what EOSC can mean for researchers. So, uh, Bob, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. So, um, if you can show a slide. Perfect. Okay. So let me see if I can get through. All right. So yeah, so the European Open Science Cloud, what I want to try and do this afternoon in the next 15 minutes is give you a brief glimpse, it can only be a brief glimpse, of what is the European Open Science Cloud and what it potentially can do uh, for researchers across Europe and beyond. So as you've heard already this afternoon, um, you know, science is in a transition. Uh, we're moving towards an open science method as the uh, modus operandi as uh, Vera highlighted in a keynote this afternoon and that represents a significant change for the way we operate and the way we perform research for all of us and um, this slide highlights a number of the points in the in the hexagons which this event has touched on already uh, earlier this afternoon the two previous days and something that the European Open Science Cloud is trying to address. So you can read it as the EOS standing for the European Open Science Cloud, but also as enable open science commons, because it all is linked to the idea of data sharing, data backpacking, and open science. The preparations for the European Open Science Cloud go back quite a number of years, uh, five years already. Um, and it's grown, grown momentum as the open science movement has evolved as well and developed and being, become more um, common across different communities and different funding agencies who have an important role to play. And the um, Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission President, last year at the World Economic Forum in Davos announced uh, the support for the European Open Science Cloud. And this represents sort of the culmination of approximately five years of preparations of putting all the elements together so that we can, across the member states of Europe and beyond, and with uh, European funding agencies such as the Commission, come to a common understanding of what the European Open Science Cloud should be and what it should do, what it should offer, and who should be involved. Um, the vision is relatively simple. Um, if we look at the, uh, the points on this petal uh, diagram, I'll highlight two of them only, don't want to go through all of them, but in the top right, the, in red, idea that it should offer the digital resources necessary for, for researchers, because researchers are the core player, the key actor for the European Open Science Cloud. Other elements as well, if you look at diagonally down from that to the bottom left in blue, the idea of developing a web of, of fair data. Talked a lot about fair data, I don't need to explain it to you, but understanding that is essential in order to enable an open uh, science culture and an open science environment 
where researchers can find what they need, share, reuse data, and so on. And then around the rest of the pedal, there are other elements that need to be done as well. We have many member states in Europe. They have their own infrastructures. How can we bring them together so that we can share? Because the science doesn't stop with national borders. We have to be able to share these things across each other. There's also the question that had been raised earlier about things, uh, digital sovereignty. So how can we ensure that the data, knowledge and services are used and developed in Europe are retaining the sovereignty over their uh, knowledge, over their intellectual property, and over the use and the, the elements that come out of those. Those are all important points that need to be put together. And of course, when we look at some of the overall challenges of pro, uh, uh, facing society today, addressing some of those global challenges by enabling interdiscipline research is also another objective when one thinks of things like climate change and so on. If, we, if the European Open Science Cloud can help to do this, it will be a very, very good result. And we can see already the work that's gone on with the COVID-19 pandemic, giving a very good example of how work can be accelerated and results achieved more quickly if researchers are able and willing to share information, data, and so on. Um, the basic underlying model for the European Open Science Cloud is, is relatively simple. There's a more detailed architecture, but let's not go into that as well. But the basic idea is the first time round, we're going to try to establish what's known as a minimum viable EOSC. So the equivalent of a minimum viable product, the first thing you put out there in the market to encourage people to make use of it. So the idea is it will bring together the federation of existing and planned research data infrastructures. Everybody knows we're not starting from a green field, there's lots of data sets, repositories, services, research infrastructures out there across Europe. And we have to find a mechanism for bringing those together, federating them. And that's the idea behind the, the MVE. It has three core important parts, the core, which I'll describe a little bit more, the federated data itself, which is really the oil of the whole uh, system, and the exchange, which is a sort of set of marketplace of services around it. And of course, the focus initially is on openly accessible fair data um, for the publicly funded research sector. Uh, and in, in order to connect discipline infrastructures and enable cross discipline research. So that's the sort of focus we have at the moment, putting this in place. Um, the timeline for this is work started in 2019. Um, it's, we're now in 2021. There are elements there already of the minimum viable EOS that are being brought together. A number of different countries, a number of uh, different projects, European projects as well, have assembled many of these elements, and we can see them there already today. And the idea is that those should be put in place and ready for more general use uh, by 2023 uh, as, as the priority. And um, then we can look at growing beyond the publicly funded research sectors towards the wider public sector and to the private sectors as users. Of course, initially we can still make use of data that comes from the wider public uh, sector, from government data and so on. And also we can continue to make use of commercially provided services within uh, the EOSC as well. The old ecosystem, uh, of course, depends very much on the participation of researchers, research performing organizations, universities, other learned societies, and so on, service providers, and mapping them onto this very simple um, architecture of EOS. You can see the different elements. We have the e infrastructures, a lot of the things that we talk about with, um, with SERP, the services have been talked about with SERP. The things we've seen today already about the the, this week, I mean, with the new supercomputer being put in place, you can see that part of the e infrastructure will be offering services there as well. Um, then there's the research infrastructures like here at CERN, the, the LHC is a research infrastructure, which generates a lot of research data, which is made openly available and shared as well. There are many other research infrastructures uh, across Europe as well. And then there's the actual federation of these research performing organizations. And that's where the real strength is, being able to connect all of these together so that they can participate in the European Open Science Cloud 
and providing access to data and services um, overall for researchers across Europe. So it's the, the participation is very important. And you see at the bottom there, it says, it's not just a technical uh, question of bringing all these things together. There is also the question of uh, aligning policies. We've heard a lot already today about the different policies associated with open science and data sharing. And above all, it is linking the people, getting the people, establishing the trust between the participants so that they are willing to work together in this environment. Looking a little bit more detail at some of the elements of that uh, arch rough architecture, the EOS Korg. So you can see some of the well-known elements in there, things that many of the research communities are already using on a daily basis, uh, authorization authentication systems, federated identity management and so on, that's there. Another cornerstone, of course, of assistance identifiers, we must have those there as well. Metadata is a very difficult subject. Each discipline has their own metadata, their own way of organizing it, but we're gonna find mechanisms, we hope, which allow us to have interoperable or ex understandable metadata using the different evolving standards uh, like CAT2 and so on that are going on there. Of course, access to the data, the services themselves, the management of the life cycle of those services and open metrics moving away from just the traditional closed uh, metric system and having a more open approach, which isn't only based on the high level publications in very prestigious journals, but also worrying about um, take, uh, the, the sharing of data, publishing of data of software and all these points as well. Of course, it has to be secure in these day and age. The cyber security is very important. So secure policies and procedures, operational elements, and of course, a web portal for GUI, even though we expect all the services to be machine actionable uh, and uh, have APIs and so on. But this is the basis of the core, the elements that everybody basically needs and you, uh, needs to use, but are not owned or controlled by any individual um, research community, but are common across them all. And there doesn't only have to be one implementation, there can be many implementations on these things, but of course, interoperability as part of this interoperability framework will be very important. If we move up the stack and look at the exchange, well, this, as I said, is more like a marketplace of services and data sets, which you can get access to. There'll be the catalogs or so, so you can find and search for data as well, but also services. And it, the idea is it will be a rich, open-ended set of services. We're not closing it. It can be added. Many service providers can be registered and participate in this as well. And they can be from the private sector, the public sector, and so on. And we're using terminology like rivalrous services. Well, what does this mean? It basically means many of the things that to the, where if you're using it, it means someone else can't use it at the same time. So if I'm using part of a storage on a disk, it means someone else can't use it. If I'm using a CPU at the moment, someone else can't use it unless we're sharing it and things like that. So those are what we mean by the rival sort of services. And you expect to find all those sort of things in uh, the exchange. The deployment models can vary. They can be on-premise. They can be uh, hybrid. They can be in the cloud. They can be in the private cloud. They can be in the public cloud. All these different uh, elements are, are foreseen and not excluded. The only thing is that there will be rules of participation, essentially adhering to necessary legislation, adhering to necessary standards, interoperability, and adhering to open science uh, policies as well. Um, to bring all this together, a new legal entity was created uh, last year called the EOSC Association. It's a not-for-profit organization that's been created under Belgian law. Uh, and the idea is this will bring a, a single voice for the, the broader European Open Science Cloud stakeholder community. It is interacting with funding agencies, member states, and so on, uh, and trying to put in place all of the vision of the European Open Science Cloud. So we have seamless access to data through these services across the full life cycle of the, uh, the research uh, uh, workload. At the moment, there's about 200 members uh, from all across Europe and further uh, 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 wider as well. From the Netherlands, there are 11 uh, members and observers already. SURF, of course, but also DALS, uh, a number of universities, including Utrecht, uh, Amsterdam, and the Technical University of Delft. There's uh, Gion uh, is a member there as well. The Clarion uh, legal entity, the ERIC, 
Lieber, uh, a few others as well, and also publishers like Elsevier are also already members and contributing to putting in place the European Open Science Cloud. And by becoming a member of the association, it means that those organizations can have a voice in helping to define the policies, the, the priorities, and the, the direction in which the European Open Science Cloud will develop over time. We're working very closely with the, the European Commission. Um, the European Commission's uh, existing programme, the Horizon 2020 programme, made great contributions in funding a number of projects which have helped to build the European Open Science Cloud. And there's a lot of support coming from the European Commission in the upcoming Horizon Europe programme, which should be finalised this month, uh, my understanding. Um, the European Open Science Cloud Association is entering into a co-programmed um, partnership with the European Commission, which will ensure that there will be funding via Horizon Europe to pursue the priorities of the European Open Science Cloud. It means that researchers, organizations, companies across Europe can apply for funding in calls which are co-developed uh, with the European Open Science Cloud Association so that they will address the, the needs of the European Open Science Cloud to include its further development and expansion. And this partnership is uh, about to be signed with the European Commission and will take us through to 2030 because many of the researchers and research performing organisations have highlighted that uh, longevity and sustainability is an important point. So. With that in mind, I just say that, of course, we recognize it's global. It's not only Europe. We're working beyond Europe using these international structures to see how we can work with other regions across the world. And just to highlight these final priorities there uh, for you, the priorities putting in place the minimum viable EOSC and getting open science to become this modus operandi using EOSC as a vehicle to do that. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bob, for this uh, very interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, is this a distributed cloud with many locations slash data centers? Yeah, by, the, by its nature, it is distributed um, across all the member states, associated countries and beyond, uh, and many organizations within that in terms of the service uh, providers, uh, the structure and the research infrastructures, it's based on a federated model of a distributed nature. And there's a, thank you very much. And there's also uh, one other question. It's uh, how will we will keep uh, such a big organization as EOSC uh, sustainable in the future? mean that the resource centers are usually depending on uh, national funding or local funding and let's say sharing resources across borders is not that easy or even going against national policy. So how would that work in EOSC? Yeah, that's a very good point. And um, the idea is that, well, the majority of the funding that goes into research uh, at the moment is nationally based and that's, that's not going to change in the future either. But aligning on the policies and uh, uh, aligning on how we could potentially share, start by sharing the data, the data services and so on around those. But clearly, with the idea that some of the services may be restricted to a well-defined set of users or by uh, discipline or by um, geographical boundaries, that's still in the EOSC model. And this is also one of the reasons why there is this separation between the core and between the exchange. It's not said that every service in exchange is free to every user. Some of the services may be uh, against payment. And some of the services may be restricted to particular subsets of users. But the difference will be is that they will be visible, they will be there, and there can be requests to share them as well. Now, we are looking at different business models. So how we can essentially 
co-fund some of these services, which appear to be um, of more general interest uh, across Europe. Um, and we're looking at different ways in which that's happening today. There are examples. If one looks at things like Euro HPC, there is agreements already so that users from other countries can potentially make use of the resources in a supercomputing site in a different country. So we know it's possible. Okay, it takes a bit of work to put it in place, but it is possible. And we're trying to work towards that inside the European Open Science Cloud as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's one other question, uh, standards and operability. Back in the day, we had tough discussions about uh, this for the grid. And how is this going to be for an even larger number of communities in EOSC? Yeah, well, uh, Jeff speaks from experience there, of course. <laughs> And the idea is that EOSC itself is not going to develop new standards, right? It's a question of collectively adopting the appropriate standards, okay? Um, in the grid world, it was a lot of new developments, new elements there. There are many of the elements that, for the European Open Science Club, which thankfully already exist. And so if we can converge and agree on the appropriate standards there, it can happen. We see it already. Um, you know, we're talking, uh, we're looking at the areas of, of AAI, for example. There seems to be a general convergence now on the, on the approaches that are being used there as well. The area of metadata is probably going to take more time, um, but it's a very important and it's a key element of what is necessary in order for EOS to work. So we know already it's attracting a lot of attention. There's a lot of projects, a lot of uh, activities going on to see if we can converge on some set of interoperable metadata. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Say, so there's one more question. Uh, would you consider e-infrastructures as a part of EOSC? Yeah, so it's very important. It's not just a question of the data. The data on its own is not very useful if you don't have the sets of services around it so that you can transport it, you can store it, so that you can process it. So yes, the e-infrastructures are a very important part of uh, the EOSC overall ecosystem as well. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now it's... Uh... Thank you very much for asking, uh, for answering our questions and uh, giving this interesting talk. Uh, for the remainder of this afternoon, we have uh, a number of videos lined up for you. Uh, the first one will be uh, by Nargis Sarabi. She's uh, sitting here right at the table. Uh, Nargis, uh, could you introduce yourself? Yes, hi, hello. Uh, my name is Nargis Sarabi. I am an advisor of uh, the research services and in particular data services uh, that we have at CERF. Uh, and uh, well, I support uh, our users and researchers in, in data, research data management and working with our data services. Uh, we also, I also support uh, uh, research communities in, in using uh, uh, data services and also uh, the ones that are being developed by the European projects such as uh, UDOT and EOSC. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the video uh, that we're going to show now is uh, Narcus will discuss uh, her work on ComBioBet and the EU Debt Data Services. Hi, my name is Narcus Zarabi. I am an advisor of the research services and data services at CERF and I work close with research communities such as CompBioMed uh, for in computational biomedicine to help them handle large data analysis and large data management. I work with CompBioMed, um, uh, computational biomedicine, where our uh, members such as University of Amsterdam and their partners uh, work on modeling, making models of uh, blood flow or to simulation of heart all the way to modeling a virtual human. So I have been a researcher myself in the field and I can see the impact that it has uh, in our daily life to make such models. Even in these times of COVID, a lot of research is being done on drug discovery, 
in this computational biomedicine field. So I really feel the impact in our daily life with this research. And the research is very data intensive and compute intensive. Uh, and we are using uh, services such as uh, U.B. b 2 safe service and uh, B2Share service to help them to manage their data. So we have made a federation of the HPC centers involved in the community um, to using the B2Safe service and based on IROT technology to help them to bring the data close to compute uh, and scale up the compute power and also make sure that the date, there is replicas of data available on different HPC sites and the data is preserved. We are also deploying uh, the UDOT B2 shared open data repository uh, to make sure that the data that is replicated across uh, different HPC centers can be easily published in the open uh, data repository and made available to the wider community. So if you're doing research in an international setting with complex workflows and data intensive workflows, you can come to us at SURF, contact us, and we will support you in implementing your data workflows using the EU services that are made through uh, European projects. So thank you. Uh, Nargas for the DICE video. Let's see if there are any questions. Oh, yeah, here we have a, a question is what is the size and the limits of the data for using these B2 uh, EU debt services? So these B2 uh, services have been developed to facilitate uh, uh, data management and uh, I must say there is no down limit so it can be used for, uh, for uh, storing or publishing uh, data sets, small data sets but it comes to interest, especially when we talk about large data sets. For example, the EU.P2 Safe service, which is based on IRIS technology and we use to federate the HPC centers. Uh, so you can imagine a research that is being done in collaboration between researchers from different uh, 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 partners, from different sites, and they want to either share data or make their data accessible to other researchers. And this, uh, in, in in the current uh, project that we're doing with the CompiMed uh, is about uh, terabytes of data in order of tens of terabytes of data. Um, and for a researcher to transfer this amount of data between uh, different sites, it, it's a very big challenge. Uh, and with the usage of the B2 safe service, we federate these HPC centers and put this infrastructure in place so that the researchers can replicate their data bring their data close to compute and they can collaborate uh, on this data and, and run simulations, have <clears throat> resilience HPC or resilience simulations on the data and have the data preserved. So I must say it's for a large, uh, well, it especially facilitates for large amount of data in order of uh, terabytes or even petabytes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, also, you were discussing uh, IROTs, but what is this kind of a service? But uh, let's say, what, what does it bring what other storage services do not have? So IROTS by itself is, is, is a framework that facilitates, uh, well, data management and, and defining data management policies and especially metadata, which we heard a lot uh, today, to uh, add metadata or annotate your data with, uh, with metadata. Uh, but this EU dot service is based on this technology. And it also brings other functionalities, for example, assigning PIDs to your data, which helps to make your data findable. Uh, or it also um, uh, offers a, a connection or integration with the, the B2Share data repository service, so where the, the data that is being replicated um, and annotated with metadata uh, can be published and made available. Uh, to uh, publicly or at least the metadata can be available and findable for other researchers. So IRIT is the techno underlying technology, but there is a lot uh, built on top of that. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So it's uh, time to move to uh, the next video, and that will be my, my colleague, Raymond Ronk. Uh, thanks for being here. And uh, oh, Raymond, uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Ron. So my name is Raymond Ronk. I'm an advisor in the uh, research development domain and specifically there within the distributed data processing team. 
Within this team, we concentrate on handling large data collections, so processing that, that, that data across multiple computer and storage sites, both in the Netherlands and throughout the world. Um, and today I'll be talking about, in this video, about the C-Scale project. The C-Scale scans for Copernicus EOSC Analytics Engines, where we are designing a solution to handle big data for Earth observation in the European Open Science Cloud. Thank you very much. So that's a nice bridge to our next video on uh, C-Scale. Hello, my name is uh, Raymond Ong. I'm an uh, advisor at SURF. I work in the distributed data processing team. So what is this the distributed data processing? Data processing is uh, about handling lots of data. And distributed means that data is located uh, at a variety of institutions or locations that you may want to combine as a researcher. Within distributed data processing, we work in many European projects. And one of the projects we've recently started is a so-called C-Scale project. Uh, C-Scale stands for Copernicus EOSC Analytics Engine. Um, this we do with uh, 13 European partners, amongst others the project coordinator EODC from Austria. One of the most important aspects of C-Scale is to bring large data sets to researchers. This has proven to be very difficult in recent years. And with C-Scale we will really change that and open new doors to this research domain. The goal of EOSC uh, C-Scale Analytics Engine is to uh, create a data federation and a compute federation for Earth observation. Now, Earth observation is an important science. It impacts all of us in our daily life. Uh, for example, you may think about climate change, business innovation, but also policy making, such as the European Green Deal. So even if you are not in research or if you are you know, just going about your daily life, even in the current COVID times, Earth observation and climate change is important to you. A SURF leads a so-called work package tree in C-Scale. In this, in this work package, we try to combine high-performance computing across Europe to enable data processing uh, on a scale that's not done before, so petabytes of data. It's this petabyte of data that's a challenge for our researchers. Uh, they come to SURF for our expertise and uh, the scale of our infrastructure. And through our expertise and the scale of our infrastructure, we can enable new science at an unprecedented scale. If you are a researcher in Earth Observation or you want to work with Earth Observation data, please come to SURF, contact us, and we'll be happy to help you out. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Raymond. Uh, let's see if we have uh, any questions for you. Um, where can I find more information and how can I participate as a researcher in C-Scale? Thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you, Imke, for asking this question. Uh, so you can find more about C-Scale on cscale.eu. It's a new website we've just launched, and you can participate there. You can also follow us on, to, on Twitter, where we have a handle, and uh, we have post all new messages. We plan to open a new call to onboard new projects uh, from the Earth Observation domain this year. So if you keep an eye on the website and our, and our Twitter, you should be seeing the launch of a new call, hopefully some point soon, and uh, I expect definitely before the end of the year, where you as an Earth Observation researcher can participate and get resources free at the point of use from EOSC. Thank you very much. And could you also elaborate a bit more on uh, what kind of data will be made available? Yeah, it's Earth's observation data, but... Uh... Yes, so we have uh, several partners, both from the compute domain, but also from the data domain. So within the data domain, we have both uh, DIAS sites, which are well-known sites within Europe that have lots of uh, Earth observation data. We have collaborative ground segment sites that also host a lot of Earth observation data from ESA and from other partners, and they will make this data freely available within the C-Scale project for participating um, members within the European Open Science Cloud. So as an Earth Observation Scientist, you can go to the EOS portal, you can find our services there, and once the call is open for new products, you can participate, apply for time, and apply for resources to get, to get these resources and that data for your project and conduct your science. Okay. Um, could you tell something about the underlying technologies that will be uh, involved? Yes, uh, we will have several platforms. We will have a cloud-based pl platform where, say, you can be uh, in charge of your own virtual machines, but we will also have high-throughput and high-performance computing in there. 
and SURF is leading the, the high throughput and high performance computing uh, tasks within the, uh, within the uh, C-scale project. So here we aim to connect, federate multiple, multiple compute sites across Europe, for example in Greece, in Italy, in Austria and in the Netherlands. And you'll be able to access all these centers uh, to do your project, to, to, to accelerate your science using these, these high performance centers. And then we'll connect these computing sites with the data federation. So you'll be able to access the data within C-Scale that you need, bring them to the compute centers, and conduct a quick and efficient analysis there. Yeah, thanks. It's time to move uh, to our next video, and that will be by uh, Mark van der Zanden, another colleague of mine. Uh, Mark, could you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Ron. I'm Mark van der Zanden. I'm a technical consultant within SURF, within the Data Preservation Services Group, and I've been involved in many EOS-related projects, and I will continue to further in those projects. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, Mark, uh, in the, his video, Mark is going to uh, give us more information of, on the European Open Science Cloud and the EOSC Future Project. I'm Mark van der Zanden. I'm the technical consultant uh, at SURF and have been involved in many EOSC related projects and also in the onboarding of EOSC uh, services in, into EOSC. EOSC stands for the European Open Science Cloud. It should provide the researchers of Europe a leading edge in scientific data infrastructures, the web of fair data. It will enable access of resources uh, from scientific disciplines across Europe to the researchers. At the moment, uh, about 250 plus resources are made available through EOSC from more than 160 providers. But how can researchers make use of those, those services? Um, and how can they get free resources available? At the moment, supported by the EC, uh, there are a number of projects available. EGIAs, DICE, Open Air Nexus, C-Skill and Reliance. These projects made make very much uh, resources available, computing, data services, and storage services, and they are all supported by uh, the EC in providing those resources. So you can get those resources for free. When you go to the EOS portal and you uh, search for those services, for those uh, projects, and then you can request those resources. The uh, resources. Um, the 1st of April, also a new project has started, which is called EOS Future. And this project will enable uh, the EOSC to bring it more to the researchers. It will develop an EOSC interoperability framework. It will extend the EOSC capabilities of, of the core. It will expand the services made available through EOSC, but also connecting the research infrastructures to, to EOSC. So if you want to get resources available through EOSC, you can go to the EOSC portal, search for the services and request those services. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mark, for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, free resources for everyone. That sounds too good to be true. So yeah. probably it isn't. So <laughs> what's the caveat here? How, uh, how would this work? Uh, it sounds too good to be true, but it is actually also true. Uh, because there are those projects which I mentioned in the video as uh, EGIAs, DICE, and some other. Uh, C-Skill is one of them. Um, there, uh, many providers are involved and they can make the resources available free at the point of use. Uh, but these are supported via virtu the virtual access mechanism of the EC. So the users and the research infrastructures who request those resources can get the, the resources, but the providers are supported financially in providing the resources, but also the manpower for enabling those resources to the resources. Okay, so I reckon that there will also be some kind of limits to resources that are distributed or given to people and that uh, it has to undergo some kind of review process, such an application, or how yes, does it work? That, uh, that is correct, of course. Uh, not all resources, and there are always mm -hmm. limits, and also financial limits also to those projects. Uh, but substantial resources are made available in an aggregated way and there are different procedures for getting those resources 
where you have some standard procedures for modest type of resources, and if you are extending above, then certainly you have to go through a review process. At the moment, also, the different projects are organizing different calls where the researchers and research uh, communities can submit proposals. Those calls and the proposals will be reviewed, and on basis of the review process and the outcome, then the resources are being provided to the research infrastructures. Okay. We have another question for you. It's, uh, what's the biggest interoperability challenge you will try to uh, solve with EOS Future? One of the biggest interoperability challenges, I think, uh, certainly the AI. Because getting access to, to, to services across different infrastructures, across different services, that has always been the biggest challenge. And you want to make it as easy as possible for the users to get those access. So if we can challenge and make the AI federated across all those services, I think then we accomplish a lot. Uh, but we are not only focusing on the AI, but we have also other uh, topics where we are addressing. For example, what also Bob mentioned on the metadata, but also the interoperability for data access, data exchange, those type of things. Okay, thank you. So let's, uh, it's time to move uh, to our last video and well, that will be my video, so I've already introduced myself, so uh, let's start the video. Hello, my name is Ron Tromper. I'm the group leader of the online data services group at SURF. Uh, today I want to talk to you about the CS3 Mesh for EOS project. And that's all about federating sync and share services. Those kind of services, sync and share services, has been around for a little more than a decade. As you all know, the Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, and the like. A number of years ago, a lot of organizations like NRANs, universities, and research institutes, and other organizations have developed their own sync and share services to be run as an on-premise service to share data. Well, what is the CS3 Mesh uh, for EOS project about? It's about federating all these resources and so that not only uh, data sharing is possible within an institute or within a group of institutes, but it's also will be made possible uh, internationally between all the sync and share services of the infrastructure, which we're going to call Science Mesh. Okay, what this project sets out to do? is to uh, enable users uh, to do an interactive data analysis with Jupyter notebooks uh, on the federated infrastructure, also to enable to make their research data fair. Uh, it will, this infrastructure will enable users to do uh, collaborative editing. Uh, and the final, the last one, fourth one, uh, that will be uh, to enable data transfers because for some use cases data locality is important and this uh, functionality will enable users to, uh, to let's say transfer data from one single share service to another. In 2014 SURF has started uh, their own single share services, SURF Drive and later on we uh, started with the uh, more research targeted research drive and altogether these uh, Services now have something like 67,000 users. And what will the, the CS3 Mesh for EOS uh, deliver to those services is the ability to do this interactive data analysis, co uh, collaborative editing, data transfers, and also making your data fair, not only for the analysts, but also in European collaborations. So SERV, SERV delivers the SERV type service and also the more research targeted research type service. The results of the CS3 Mesh uh, for EOS project will be incorporated in these services and will benefit you as a user. The absolute coolest thing about CS3 Mesh for EOS will be that you will be enabled to collaborate with almost half a million of your colleagues in Europe. Well, thanks myself for this video. <laughs> So, uh, thanks for uh, all being with us this afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers of this afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Bob. Thank you, Bob, for being with us this afternoon. Uh, thanks, Raymond, Nargis, and Mark. And, uh, well, we hope you have uh, had a very uh, pleasant afternoon with uh, lots of interesting information that came your way. And uh, thanks for being with us. <laughs>